I'm ready, yeah. Okay. Hi, welcome. This is a four o'clock presentation called Accelerating the Cloud, Maximizing Network Performance for OpenStack. I'm Richie Aikawa with SolarFlare. So welcome everybody. What I'm gonna cover today, I know most of you may not know about SolarFlare, so I'll talk a little bit about our company, our product portfolio, and I'll talk about what we're, what we're delivering today in terms of being able to make VMs more scalable and how we can improve bare metal performance. So we get bare metal performance within virtualization and in containers, and then what we're doing to connect all that up to OpenStacks. So the primary thing I want to let you know is that we've been working a lot on the network infrastructure so that we can have that be optimally optimum for network performance, and then we're going to do all the add-ins up into OpenStack so that you can use Horizon and Heat to be able to take advantage of it through our, through our connections uh, to Neutron and Nova. But a little background on SolarFlare. So what SolarFlare does today is that we develop network solutions to help you to accelerate, to monitor, and to secure your network data. And we do that through a variety of, of products. And I'll show you where, we, where we've, we've laid our stake in terms of where we're market share leaders, and, um, and this is going to be on the, the financial services sector. So let's see. So our company. Um, just the main thing to let you know, we have over 1,300 customers worldwide. We partner with companies like Red Hat, with VMware, Citrix, and a lot of the switch companies, Arista and Cisco and, and others. Our products are delivered into the marketplace by our reseller channel, as well as through HP and IBM, who private label our products into the marketplace. Our headquarters are down in Southern California and Irvine, and we have development centers over in Cambridge, UK, which is actually part of the merger between a level five networks in Cambridge, who developed a lot of our technology and with uh, SolarFlare in Irvine. And we've opened up an R&D facility over in New Delhi, India. So this is a list of our, our, our customers. So you'll notice that a lot of the premier companies. So um, what we like to say is, um, like nine out of 10 equity trades that happen in the marketplace today will be happening on solar flare equipment. So, so new, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, CME, SIBO, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, all these stock exchanges are using our products. So they're very reliable, very high performance products in terms of low latency and um, high message rates. Okay. So this is, so we develop our own network controllers, we develop our own adapters, and we even have an FPGA-based product so you can do inline processing uh, for both pre- and post-processing of network data on the fly, on the wire. Uh, this is good for things like uh, normalization of, of information coming from the, the, the ticker information coming from the exchanges, for encryption, for decryption on the fly, for codec and uh, decoding uh, you know, on, on the fly in terms of already having it done before you have to use the actual application servers. We support all the variety of OSs and hypervisors, and then we have a variety of software applications upon which you can lay uh, your uh, services on top of our network adapter. So we'll talk a little bit about things like network functions virtualization and being able to use the adapter to be able to, as a platform, for you to be able to run services. Okay. So, so, so what are we delivering in, in terms of our adapter? So we're delivering High performance, low latency, 10 and 40 gig network adapters. Our adapters are very cut through architecture. We support the various stateless hardware offloads for TCP segmentation offload, the large receive offload, the generic segmentation offload, uh, IPv4, V6, and TCP UDP checksums. Uh, we have 2,048 virtual interfaces on our adapter, and you'll see how that becomes relevant when we start to talk about scalable VMs and about scalable performance. 16 physical functions on our adapter, so we have a a two-port adapter will come with 16 physical functions as well as 16 MAC addresses. So you'll be able to have a single adapter that can be partitioned up into 16 different segments. So you can, it'll be an asymmetrical partition. You can have one MAC address on one port, 15 on another, or eight and eight, depending on how you split it up. And it'll appear to the operating system as if you have 16 uh, uh, ports, uh, devices uh, attached to the, to the, into the operating system that'll go out to two physical interfaces. Uh, this could be used for things like storage segmentation, um, network management traffic, and we're adding the ability for you can have quas features in terms of priority settings, in terms of bandwidth control, rate limiting on these. So the adapters become very flexible in how they can be deployed in the various um, servers. 
And we offer 240 virtual functions, and you'll see how that is becoming relevant in terms of the virtualization uh, performance capabilities. And then we have AppFlex licenses. So we have a technology that's called um, AppFlex, so application flexibility to be able to deploy on t terms of, of an adapter. You have a physical adapter that's now providing you your basic network connectivity at 10 and 40 gig, high performance, and now you want to be able to do things like packet capture on that. You want it to be able to do things like uh, uh, a filter engine packet filter so you can do DDoS mitigation, and I'll show you how that uh, is actually relevant for the, the virtualization space. If you wanted to do precision hardware-based time stamping of Ethernet and PTP packets and time synchronization across your network, that's service can now be added to your adapter, and as well as performance monitoring for both ingress and egress timestamps. And we also have uh, our, our, our flagship product is something that's called Open Onload. It's an open source project that we're the maintainers of that allows you to do kernel bypass middleware. And I have a slide to talk about how it's, this is all Ethernet sockets compliant, so it's not using Infinivan verbs or anything for RDMA technology. It's actually no application changes necessary, runtime calls to be able to use a kernel bypass technology. So this is on load. Um, on your left is your typical TCP stack that goes to the kernel, and on the right is using on load where we run in user space. We have a TCP IP stack that runs in user space that has a front end that attaches to applications to provide a sockets interface. So it's pure BSD sockets, POSIX compliant, you run your, it coexists with the TCP stack, so at runtime you could decide if you're going to use the kernel or if you're going to actually use this kernel bypass technology, and through it you get reduced latency by by bypassing the kernel stack, but equally important, you have higher message rates that are capable through it, as well as being able to run uh, very deterministic, so low, low jitter in terms of getting the data to and from the, off the network. Okay. And this is a graph showing in terms of kernel performance. So if you look at the, the, the red slide, uh, this is using just a Linux kernel stack with one core. If you're using two cores with the Linux kernel stack, you can see on the left axis, on the axis, on the Y axis here, you have latency in terms of, of, of microseconds. So you're running at about five mi microseconds. If you're actually using like the Linux kernel 3.10 version and you use BusyPull, it's very CPU intensive, but you can get that down to sub four microseconds of performance. But if you're using onload and you're only using one core, you're down into the, with onload, about 1.7 microseconds. This is a half round trip UDP. So we're doing a ping pong from one server to another server, half round trip, one way across on UDP, and we're down to about 1.67 microseconds of latency. Uh, and you can see also on the, on the x-axis, this is message rates. So not only do we have much lower latency, the message rates get much higher in terms of performance on this, this product. And and this is used quite, quite a bit in terms of the financial services, but it's also used in the HPC marketplace, and onload is also valuable where we're seeing in terms of like web server application usage. So the web server in terms of latency does become important because one of the most important aspects of the web, this is actually interesting, one of our customers is Cloudflare, and they're talking about bandwidth is not an issue, it's about latency for anybody who's doing a web server application because once you start clicking that web and you don't get a response, you're off to another site to try to figure out why something's not being responsive. So that initial latency is, is very important for even a web server application. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about cloud networking. So that's all the SolarFlare products in, in our portfolio. Um, so, so cloud networking, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, so you got a new level of service of, you know, flexibility, IT automation, and scale out of compute storage and networking products. And so, and with server virtualization also. So this is all server virtualization, as you know about commoditization of hardware. You can run all these different um, uh, industry standard servers and be able to load your server, uh, your server OS images and run it into VMs and all. But the problem with running server virtualization typically is that you run into a performance hit, that the hypervisor does get involved. And so, you, you end up having VM scalability limitations as well as application latency issues in terms of how fast you can go through the stack. And I'll have a slide later to show you. This is like an order of magnitude of latency performance where you go from server to server. If you go from VM to VM, you're looking at about a 30 microseconds versus what, what I was just telling you about with onload of being able to get down to 1.7 microseconds latency. And how can we get that level of performance even in a virtualized environment? Is what I'm about to talk about here. So how can we help you in, in terms of all these, uh, in, in an open stack environment and, and virtualization and all? So we can provide you with more scalable clouds, so you get more VMs 
for our network adapter to maintain performance. We can allow you to get bare metal performance even in a virtualized environment, and we'll talk about also in containers. Um, and we can also allow you to virtualize some network services and run those. Instead of having it all run in terms of appliances, you can start to flexibly deploy virtualized network services like packet capture, filtering firewall capabilities, uh, and even and precision time synchronization on, uh, within VMs. So this is a use case. So we have a private cloud provider today that has a private cloud environment where they're trying to deploy up to 450 VMs. So it's all about breaking down and you know, tearing up, um, creating and breaking down virtual machines so that developers can to use the site. Uh, and they're wanting to be able to get scalable performance, not have to add, continue to add more network adapters as they add more VMs. And so we're, this is a comparison of us. This is, this is the, um, the, the Intel um, X520, but the, the idea here is that because of our architecture, we're able to add, continue to add VMs and maintain a high level of performance. So the, the counter is, of course, that you continue to add more and more cards so you can have more and more bandwidth as you add more VMs. So scalable VMs to the customer, what that meant to them was that as they deployed all these servers, a 23% increase in performance allowed them to save in terms of how many physical servers they had to deploy, as well as how many adapters they had to deploy with it. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little and talk about how do I get, uh, this is all about SRV, so everybody who's doing anything today with Kilo knows about what OpenStack is doing is try to make the SRV capabilities uh, available so that you can have low latency applications be able to be used in a complete private cloud environment. So customers today are saying, I've got my low latency applications running here, I cannot yet bring them into my cloud or my virtual server virtualization farms because that doesn't allow me to support those low latency requirements that I have. So how do I get to that point? And so I'm going to walk through the storyline on this. If you're not familiar with SRV, it stands for Single Root IO Virtualization. It's a PCI SIG standard that's been around for over 10 years. And single root means a single complex. So this is on a single server, uh, being able to virtualize the IO channels for both storage and networking. So in the past, and what people did before was, of course, you had emulation when you first started off. Everybody emulated like an Intel E1000 adapter, uh, very slow performance. Then the hypervisor vendors ended up having a para virtualize. So it was no longer pure virtualization where the OS uh, didn't know that it was running in a guest operating system. It now knows that it is. In fact, it has a para virtualized driver. So in the case of like, uh, with KVM, they have a vertio-net driver and then VMX-net3 driver in, in, um, in uh, ESXi. So when you load ESXi and it tells you, asks you what driver do you want to, what network interface you want to use, you would typically select the VMX-net3 interface as, as the interface. So this is, this is what typically you run, and this is still running, into, even with para-virtualized, that's that, I'll show you later, about that's that 30, 20, 30 microseconds of performance you get with that interface. So SRV, of course, is hypervisor bypass, and in the KVM world, it's uh, PCI pass-through, and in the VMware world, they call it direct path IO. So it's the ability to bypass the hypervisor and be able to let the VM load your driver up in the VM and let it talk directly to your hardware and be able to get access to the hardware resources to be able to get the performance that you need on that adapter. So we provide 240 virtual interfaces and 16 physical interfaces. So 256 interfaces available from a single adapter within a hypervisor environment so that you can load, if you had 450 guests like that one customer had, then you can actually, from a single adapter, be able to, you can put in like two interfaces into the hypervisor itself to let it run non latency intensive applications and then, or, or VMs, and then you can use the 254 other uh, interfaces and let it talk directly to our hardware and get access to the hardware resources. What we've been working on in addition to that is to be able to do both simultaneous kernel bypass or open onload I was talking about, as well as hypervisor bypass inside of a VM. So now you can run your low latency applications down to that two, sub two microsecond applications within a VM. And now you have the ability to be able to migrate your low latency applications to within your private cloud environment as well as you know, um, into server virtualization farms. So this is, um, we're working with a large financial services company, an exchange, 
who is building an OpenStack private cloud, and they want to do exactly that. They want to have one contiguous private cloud, an OpenStack instance, and be able to have all of their applications brought into that OpenStack instead of having it run off as a separate ent entity. And they want to use KVM as the base, um, um, and it's actually with Red Hat and KVM as their base virtualization platform to do so. And so, um, so we're running this scenario here on the bottom left in terms of taking from a standard virtualization, now we're going to both be running hypervisor and kernel bypass technology. Um, so this is what kind of performance you're able to get. On the, on, the, on the graph right there, that orange is actually running PCI pass-through with Linux and an open onload guest. And so that's right about at two microseconds of latency. And I was seeing in bare metal, we're running about 1.7. There's some things that we're still working out relative to um, um, getting that down to the same exact bare metal performance. And, and, I'll, sh and I'll talk about in containers, we actually do identically get in bare metals and container, containers the same level of performance. But if you're running in a VM guest and you're running with the pair virtualized driver, this is actually on ESXi with VMX Net 3, then you're running at about 28 microseconds of latency. So we've been able to bring down that latency performance that they were getting, why they weren't bringing in those high performance applications into the cloud they are running at 28 microseconds. Now they're able to get it down to the two microseconds, and that meets the requirements for them to be able to now port and have a single OpenStack environment where they can run all of their applications and be able to have it move around in their, in their, in their cloud environment. Um, so what about Linux containers? If you know about Linux containers, and, and the Red Hat folks down there will tell you more about it you know, relative to Docker-based uh, formatted containers that they have. So it's essentially running with uh, you know, shared libraries, so you're running the same operating system, and it's really about isolating applications from one another. So you're actually running, virtualization is like isolating server OSs. This is about isolating applications. So there's a shared library that is used with Linux containers, but so we have a paper at our booth over there, as well as with Red Hat. You can, from their site, you can download this paper that Jeremy Eater, you know, their, um, their network guru over at, at Red Hat, actually wrote up in terms of being able to get the same bare metal performance in a Linux, as they call it, a, a Docker formatted Linux container on a RHEL 7 or RHEL 7 with RHEL Atomic that you can get in bare metal RHEL. So the final thing, so, so this is all the infrastructure, the things that we've been doing to try to make um, private, you know, um, private clouds be able to harness all the abilities of, of network accelerated performance. The final thing is on, I want to talk about is on uh, DDoS mitigation. So one of the services that we're delivering that you can have in bare metal is to be able to protect servers at the endpoint from a DDoS attack. And so we have a, a hospitality company, so one of the big large hotel chains tells us that you know, when, when they get DDoS attacks, they are, they're always under DDoS attack. And, but a DDoS attack can also be when they run a sale or promotion and all of a sudden their website gets hit as if it's a DDoS attack. Or somebody makes a miscue when they're loading up a new uh, web, web, web page or something and so all of a sudden they've got something that's looking like a DDoS attack. And what they want to do is they want to have some headroom so that they can handle the barrage of, uh, of, of all the in, incoming requests without the server coming down completely. So today, if you're using IP tables, or if you, like, and this is with the example here is like if you're using Nginx as your web server, um, then when it gets hit, what happens is that it has an immediate cliff. All of a sudden, it'll come down, and the performance will come down, and your server is out, and you're going to get the no access from you know, the server. So what we have with our filter engine is the ability to do rate limiting. So we'll, we will note that we're under attack and be able to start rate limiting. So at least your server will stay up and running and won't go down. And then you will start to ability to do filtering and blocking. So we can update, we do hardware filtering and we augment that with software filtering so that your web server can have a eight to 10 increase in terms of the life of the connection so that somebody can come and actually help fix the problem and you can update your filter tables so you know, uh, like if, if you know where those, um, those attacks are coming from. So we, we have an interface to something like a Norse blacklist. If you're familiar with these blacklists, that show you where all these incoming attacks are coming from. You can augment the list for the IP tables and say, okay, now we're now going to block off all those IP attacks that we know that, are, that have been documented as coming across and you know where they're typically coming across from, from the two major countries over there uh, that start with China and Ukraine that are attacking the US all the time. So this is where we can actually integrate in with various blacklists. 
and that's the service that we're delivering. So this requires uh, very high performance underneath it as well um, from our adapters. So our adapters provide this network platform and we're providing this capability for all the low level acceleration, but we're also delivering network services that can be used in, in, a, in a private cloud in implementation. So, so finally, the conclusion. So I've talked all about this network function um, capability that we're adding with SRV, with containers, with these network services. And so we've been spending all of, you know, so this is a part of a rollout. We have this today shipping on KVM. We have this as a technology preview on ESX. And we're going to be rolling out on Hyper-V as well, supporting the, the three major um, hypervisors out in the marketplace. So our focus is now shifting to be able to, to integrate that in and provide the interfaces up through Neutron and Nova so that when you are deploying a through Horizon or Heat, you're deploying, you are now are aware of what the SRV capabilities are of the underlying network adapters in the marketplace and be able to get this level of performance. And with that, are there any questions?